Hello everybody. Welcome to the channel and to this video specifically. Today I kind of want to talk about the recent development with the Postal Service assigning a new contract uh, to design their next generation delivery vehicles as they call them. And a couple of concerns I've seen uh, presumably from left-leaning people. Um, uh, and it's not like a huge concern or anything, but I just kind of want to nip it in the bud uh, before it becomes one or before we get a little bit lost in the weeds um, regarding uh, the development of this kind of a large-scale project. So if you're not aware, the Postal Service um, has been using their long-life vehicles, their LLVs, for the better part of the past 35 years. Uh, they were in production from 1987, uh, with the last ones being purchased in 1994. Um, some of these vehicles uh, literally have over a million miles driven on them. Uh, there is a growing concern uh, with the rise in their maintenance costs and the development of like how you know most uh, people who work for the Postal Service and just carriers in general, UPS and everything like that, they're delivering more packages now instead of delivering letters. And so LLVs are not designed very well with that goal in mind. They're designed with like the idea that you have a bunch of uh, letters and like magazines and stuff and then you put like what minuscule packages you'd be delivering in the back of the truck. So um, with this in mind, there's been a new contract given to Oshkosh uh, an American-based uh, defense military contractor, vehicle manufacturer, um, and uh, for their next-generation vehicle. Now, the vehicle, uh, I'll show you a picture of it here, looks pretty cool. Um, I mean, I like I like the way it looks. It, it's kind of goofy looking, maybe, maybe a bit, but uh, it's, uh, it's pretty dope. Next-generation delivery vehicle. All right, so it looks like this. So, we got our straight out of cars uh, front windshield design here. Yep. Yeah. Yep, yep, looking nice and nice and thick in the back, right? Just like a dump truck of a mom's ass you expect to see from a Pixar character. Uh, I don't know what that is, but yeah, and there's someone delivering in a stock photo. So basically, I tried see, seeing if I could find like a coherent criticism of this, but I've heard, I, I was basically zoning out and I was listening to, uh, or I was just like playing a game and just kind of listening to a recent stream uh, from Hassan, just kind of as background noise. And then someone did this don't this comment, and he read it, and just it got me thinking because I'd seen this sentiment before in some other leftist spaces. Why are we getting a defense company to make our mail trucks? Now he doesn't answer the question, and so I thought that I would. So here's the thing. Um, having something specially designed for your industry is not exactly an easy task to do uh, when you're a large-scale manufacturer that's like focused on profits. The amount of trucks that are currently in service right now for the Postal Service is upwards of like 150,000. So companies aren't going to really create entire like manufacturing centers to specially design literally one type of vehicle for one company or maybe two because i know that the llv also sold in canada um for their their post service so the previous llv was developed by uh grumman grumman of northrop grumman fame the defense contractor and uh, these companies are better equipped frankly for manufacturing specialized vehicles so on a practical basis you go with what's best. So another thing that you need to factor in as well is that it's not like the USPS was like, we're only going to pick a defense contractor. They specifically went with, they, they held like a competition and they had carriers test tons of these vehicles from many different companies. And in fact, right now there's an issue going on. Uh... 
let's see if I can find it here. Where uh, I think it's called work group. Stock price. Yeah. So work group was betting on getting this contract. And a lot of people thought that they would. So their stock has deflated because they didn't get it. So it's not like we just picked a company, right? And went, this is the company we want. They lost the competition for the, the contract because their vehicle didn't meet the standard that was being set. So here's the deal. Why are defense contractor like why why is the sentiment coming up, right? Well, because defense contractors are not exactly known for like being steward, stewards of morality, right? Like they their their industry in many ways is murder. Um and death. You know, yeah, you can say it's defense, and of course there is an argument to be made there about, you know, defense in general, but most wars uh, and thus, you know, the arms that are manufactured, the vehicles manufactured, the munitions manufactured, so on and so forth, to fund uh, and carry out these wars throughout the world on behalf of the United States and the allies of the United States have been for uh, non-defensive purposes, to put it mildly. With that in mind, um, this this negative stigma, I think, is justified. But here's the deal. If we're going to talk about power, political power, uh, frankly saying, you're bad, I don't want to deal with you anymore, isn't going to be effective. Um, defense contractors have a very large stake in the national economy. Uh, they employ hundreds of thousands of people. They have a stranglehold on our lobbying system for both major political parties. So... You can't just ignore that. So the idea would be to retrofit it. So uh, the thing is, is like if we really wanted to do like a full revitalization of our infrastructure, you know, to like go toward like a Green New Deal like AOC has talked about, for example, defense contractors would play a huge role in that, right? Even when we're talking about like the recent um, uh, scandal going on right now in regards to the uh, concentration camps at the border, and how we are dealing with an overcrowding problem. And so we're having to move kids that are unaccompanied. And of course other people too. There are other centers being set up as well. Uh, we have to move them from these like camps of squalor. Giant cages and giant warehouses. Uh, and some were actually reopened internment camps from the 1940s internment of the Japanese uh, in America. Uh, to other facilities. So uh, someone had flamed AOC recently because AOC basically said that we need to have like licensed facilities, um, and someone basically flamed her, saying like this is you know proof that you don't matter or that you're a sellout. Uh, and this is hyperbolic. So while it is true that Biden is not moving fast enough uh, on this issue, not aggressive enough on this issue. Um, and the Democrats in general in the House are not moving aggressive enough on this issue in terms of like straight up just taking away ICE funding for their their uh, their contribution to this mess, you know, in regards to their um, straight up inhumane uh, deportations of like literal children at times. Uh, recently, like since Biden took office, uh, but also too like these uh, contracts that we have with private companies. Um, need to be ended and they need to be essentially these these camps need to be nationalized with like a national emergency public health emergency uh, mindset and uh, that's not being done but here's the thing even if that were being done we would still need to build more facilities like we we can house children when we can you know, like, and because we, we do have, like, rehousing programs with, like, families within the United States, like, chaperoning programs. Um, but, like, we still, there, there's, frankly, too many people, and that process takes too long. So we would need to do this anyway. So the idea would be to use the bully pulpit and the political power of the executive branch to force the issue faster. And it would involve building camps like this. It would just involve it. Because when we're undoing 
a trauma that has been done, which, you know, I was very critical of uh, the way Obama handled the migrant children crisis. I made a video on a secondary channel fucking like seven years ago talking about how um, like it, the, the whole characterization of the issue is a problem and how it is a refugee crisis and the way that we were handling it is a travesty uh, under Obama. But what Trump did was nearly genocidal. Child separation? Like, expanding the amount of camps that we had? Like, these are not small things. And undoing that is going to be hard. So even if Bernie were in office, it would still involve this process. But I think a big difference between Bernie and Biden is that he would be able to communicate that a little bit more effectively. And whereas... Biden kind of, in some ways, you know, and this I think this is more characteristic of his followers and people that supported him kind of vociferously compared to him himself. But when you characterize yourself as the unifier and you think of, like, Trump being gone as, like, oh, now we can breathe easy, uh, I don't think Bernie would have done that. Because I think uh, Bernie maintained pretty consistently that if you are going to be, you know, in a position of power and you're going to come in, uh, to that position of power. The work is just beginning then and there. You know, it's not something that, oh, hey, we elected our favorite person. Everything is good now. That's not how that works. So, the, um, basically, the reason why I'm bringing this up in particular is that on the left, if we're going to consider our uh, political clout <laughs> and what little of it there is, we have to work within the system that exists around us. Even when you're doing local organizing, you still have to deal with the police. You still have to deal with uh, the city council that doesn't give a fuck. You still have to deal with um, the, the the stratification of, of people in general. To, to, to the point to where like your, your like mutual aid work, for example, feels never-ending. that you're not making a dent in the problem. So you have to do an all of the above strategy. And that means that, you know, you're going to utilize the government as best you can to suit your to suit your goal. So why we get back to the the, a very easy issue of how we can characterize this is with the Postal Service. So the Postal Service, of course, funds itself. So this isn't maybe the best example, um, but it, it, I think it, 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 it applies because it is a government agency. So what's the problem? Well, first of all, <laughs> these trucks are old as fuck. They're falling apart. As I mentioned earlier, some of these motherfuckers have over a million miles on them. The maintenance cost for these things is fucking astronomical. It has led to people getting hurt. And again, these things get like nine miles to the gallon. So if you give a shit about the environment at all, well, I can tell you right now, these trucks ain't it. Now, the new trucks have a lot of capabilities that, frankly, they, they, it, it's important to keep, keep in mind. So, they have hot swappable powertrains. So, right now, they do have um, motors being designed by Ford. And uh, they're, they're, they're uh, hybrid engines, to my understanding. And when the Postal Service... Uh, is able to redesign its infrastructure so that it can have, like, you know, battery charging stations at every post office, or at most post offices, at least. Um, they can swap the powertrains out for an electric one. That's a big deal. If we're talking about longevity here and lower maintenance costs, that's a big deal. Having something that's specially designed for the task that you're doing is easier on the people doing the job. 
So the task now calls for people ordering like fucking bed frames and shit off of Amazon. Well, you're going to want something that you can stand inside to do that, which these allow for. But here's the thing, like when people are being a little nitpicky about, oh, well, why is a defense contractor getting it? And like, dude, like, come on, use your head here. I would much rather have a defense contractor making this than bombs or tanks. And the thing is, is the people that work for these companies, for like defense contractors and stuff, they're not stupid people. They're extremely talented engineers. And you want to give them a goal that it's easy to achieve. The reason why this thing looks goofy as fuck the reason why it looks goofy as fuck is because it's designed for a specific task. And that's a task that most trucks and stuff don't do. It needs to be low enough to the ground so that the person can reach out the window and deliver to a mailbox. But it needs to be tall enough to stand in. It needs to have a bunch of safety features. Do you know that LLVs don't even have airbags? They don't have air conditioning? I mean, this, these things have, like, cameras on them and shit, too. And frankly, like, you're not going to get a company like Ford to set aside an entire segment of their manufacturing process in America, because that was one of the stipulations of the contract with the Postal Service, is that the, the manufacturing has to be done in America, because a lot of Ford uh, parts are made in Mexico. And they're, they're, they're not going to do that. For, you know, 230,000 units or whatever it ends up being. You know, it's a 10-year contract, but that's only 10 years, right? Like, they think about next quarter. So, Oshkosh, of course, is a... They have specialized manufacturing equipment. They can do this kind of stuff because they design weird shit for the military. Oshkosh vehicles. Let's see if we can just look up some examples here. They designed specialized equipment all of the time. Like, look at this thing. Look at this thing. Can I blow this image up? Oh. You know, they designed these. So they, they designed these kind of videos, or videos as well. They designed these kind of vehicles. So it's not to say that like the military, def you like you have to def defend def defense contractors. They don't need me to defend them. They have you know they have enough money to pay a good lawyer for it. But it's no fucking joke though, that you know when you're able to manufacture like specialized equipment, and that is your specialty. It's better than manufacturing like going off of existing uh, existing chassis. Like, one of the issues that was happening right now uh, with the LLVs, too, not right now, but they were adopted off of the chassis of uh, a mass-produced Chevrolet uh, chassis. I can't remember which model off the top of my head. Um, and the thing is, is they rated them for 10 years. And if you recall, it's been 35 years. These are designed with a two-decade lifespan in mind. So we can acknowledge the good of this kind of engineering aesthetic, or not aesthetic, ethic, when it does good. And not be like, oh, well, hey, they're associated with bad things, therefore throw the whole thing out. Because here's the deal. You're going to, like, it, when the socialist revolution comes, you're going to need these people. I'm not talking about, like, the leaders that are, like, cynically making money and profiting off of war. But like the engineers, right? The manufacturing base, you're going to need these things. And frankly, that shit ain't going to happen overnight. In America, a fucking revolution is more likely to be fascist than it is to be socialist anyway. So <laughs> let's get that out of the way. But we're going to need to be able to move toward these steps or take steps toward this kind of re retrofitting uh, these kind of companies and manufacturing bases toward things that are 
beneficial to most people. So take this small example and make it bigger. If the Green New Deal happens, we're going to need people redesigning highways. We're going to need people thinking about what does it mean to have a city that is uh, ecologically friendly? What kind of roads do we need to build? What kind of public infrastructure do we need to make? You know, a lot of these same type of engineers would be involved in like uh, magnetic trains going across the country, like light rail systems that exist like in China and stuff. Now, of course, I'm a bit more aggressive when it comes to like what a politician should do. And so I would say like to use the Defense Production Act. Call climate change a national emergency and basically force companies to start doing this shit. So you can see the name. But here's the thing. That ain't going to happen right now under Joe Biden. Because, I mean, they're more focused on, like, Chinese espionage, like with Obama. And, then, of course, Obama and then Trump was just. Ugh. OK, I, I didn't even want to get into Trump. So. The point is. Is that take the good where it comes. All right. Like. This shit ain't going to happen overnight. It's not something that is going to be easily done. It's not something that involves, like, quite literally, like, a delete and restart. Because, look, I have very strong leftist leanings and a very, very strong Marxist critique of political economy and, you know, structural, like, superstructures within the economy and everything like this. I do my best to read, like, theory and shit. I don't understand a lot of it. I have to reread a whole bunch. And I listen to people that know a lot more than me. Um... And I know enough to know how much I don't know. And I know damn well that I don't know how to do any of this shit. You know? Like, I'm not even a mechanic. So, I I don't know. I, 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 I understand the cynicism. But we have to be a bit more mindful about what our approach is moving forward when, when utilizing what little political power we have. If at the end of the day... You're just saying that's bad and unwilling to, to commit to any action. Then you're no better than someone who doesn't participate at all. All you're doing is not participating while having an opinion and like loudly. And no one gives a shit about that. If anything, it makes us look worse on the left. So at the end of the day, I'm happy the post office is getting new shit. Um, and I, I'm, I'm, I think that like most people understand like how, like what I'm saying is pretty pragmatic. Um, but you know, it's, uh, it's something that I, I very well, I guess could be wrong on. Maybe I'm just not approaching it the right way. So if I'm wrong, let me know. You know, I like learning. I'm not really married to many positions. I like, I like to learn. So let me know. But uh, yeah, like it, dislike it, subscribe or don't. I hope you have yourself a wonderful day, a wonderful night. I hope you drank water today. Okay, that's important. Stay hydrated and uh, wash your ass. Love you.